thank you <laughs> wow, for talking to us. Uh, yes, uh, can you say a little bit about how you how you start doing verbatim works? Uh, hmm. Yes. Well, I was I was living in London uh, some time ago, and I get in contact with a theatre there that was working in Argentinian plays. As, as you know, Argentina has a very rough history. Yes. And they I, were. I just saw the play Argentina 1985. Mm -hmm. um, the, the the film Argentina oh, yeah. 1985. Uh, yeah. When I went on the planes here. Uh -huh. Yes. Yes. And they were creating uh, a set of plays uh, called Theatre for Identity. They are meant to be plays to remember what happened during the dictatorship there. Uh -huh. So I was working in production. I was doing, you know, bringing coffees and this kind of thing. And I learned a lot about how the waiting place could uh, make an impact on the audience. So I was studying a master's there, and I decided to do something similar. Uh, first in London, and then back to Spain. And the first play I did was about FGM, which is um, female uh, genitalia mutilation, which is a big issue in, in Europe, especially in the UK, because there were a lot of kids, especially girls from uh, from different backgrounds that went mutilated and nobody got detained or nobody went to prison or anything like that. It was meant to be something cultural. So I joined up with uh, a person there and we started doing interviews with people that suffer this kind of thing or that worked in this area or performed this kind of uh, mutilation. And the play was called Little Stitches, and now it has been, it has been published uh, on a book. And it was a, I would say it was a success. I mean, we went into The Guardian and uh, we got uh, really good reviews. I've got it. So, yeah, that, actually that's, <laughs> that's the book. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's the book. Yes. That is. Uh, so we were very happy with that. And then I started doing plays on uh, historical memory here in Spain. In Spain, we had a very rough history as well. We had a dictatorship for 40 years, and then after the dictatorship, everything closed down and nobody got investigated. There was a general amnesty. So there are certain stories there that were uh, worth talking about. So the massive play I created was called uh, The Bread and the Salt, which is about a trial of a judge that wanted to investigate these crimes, crimes against mm. humanity, genocide, etc., etc. And he himself got judged or trialed. Yeah. So the charges were that he was trying to uh, investigate something that couldn't be investigated. So by Spanish law, you cannot investigate those crimes. Now it has changed a little bit. But at that time, you weren't allowed as a judge to investigate these crimes. So he got himself trialed. And the play is about that trial. So yeah. I get access to the documents. Mm and interview a couple of people, uh, um, lawyers and people that were experts on this. And then I created a play that was uh, first on Teatro del Barrio and then in, in the biggest Spanish theatres. It was a very, uh, very massive play because it, it had 20 actors, uh, it had big names and that. And I think it was, you know, a very nice experience. So those are more or less my trajectory in Vivatian theatre. Yeah. So, um, so you also added apart from verbatim theater, you also working on as you told me, you are working on a mm. play that's not verbatim. That's more like in a conventional mm. type. Uh, so you don't just work on verbatim. You also work on mm -hmm. plays that are more well, you know, more conven conventional or mainstream mm -hmm. way drama. Mm -hmm. So, w what is the difference when you work on these two forms? Well, I think you have to be more careful when you do a verbatim theatre. I mean, if you're doing a fictional play, entirely fictional, uh, you can always make up stuff. You can create a character, then another character, then the, uh, you know, the argument, etc., etc. But when you're working with verbatim theatre, you are um, you're obliged to tell the truth. Uh, you can manipulate uh, the audience and say, well, this was told by this interview or disappear in the newspaper because that will, uh, will be unethical. Yeah. Let's suppose that you are doing a verbatim theater, a verbatim play about a trial, and then you just get 
extracts of the things that match your interest or match your political ideology, you could very well create a propaganda play where basically it serves only your purposes. If you do that on a fictional play, people can tell you, you are right wing, you're left wing, you're a fascist, you're a communist. But if you do the Vatican play, you are conveying the meaning that that is the truth. But the playwright also has a responsibility. I mean, the play cuts and manipulates and puts here and uses like general structures of playwriting for creating that verbatim play. And that's, that's the big risk, that you are using the verbatim play to send a message, but saying, well, this is the truth, because I took it from the interviews. And then what effectively you're doing is propaganda. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest, the biggest risk and the biggest difference as well. Like you can skip ethics very quickly if you don't, don't pay attention to that. Mm. Mm. So it's, when you decide to use, um, is, it, is it your decision to decide to use verbatim or not? Uh, for example, like the first play you did, Little Stitches, yeah. is, it, is it up to your choice whether to use verbatim or not? You decide to use verbatim yeah. or you yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's not, it's, um, I mean, it, it, because I've read that Little Stitches somehow is an organization who start this project and ask you to join this project. So mm -hmm. is it the organization that have the say or you yourself mm -hmm. decide to do verbatim? So mm -hmm. what's, in, what's in that situation? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, uh, I was one of the producers of the play. The company was... Uh, uh, a company created by um, Melissa Dean, and uh, it was called Bear Truth Theatre, and they had a play, and they were looking for partners, colleagues, to produce uh, new plays. So we decided about the topic, and we decided about the playwrights as well. I was going to be one of the playwrights, and then we chose another three. Uh, then after, well, soon before the, uh, the production was done, I, I just jumped off because I couldn't uh, work more with, with them because of time. So I decided to do the verbatim play, or a verbatim play, out of my topic, uh, of the topic. And the reason was because I, I couldn't write about survivors of FGM doing fiction. I don't think that would be fair, because I, I cannot experience female mutilation, because I'm a man, or I identify as a man, so I, I cannot have that. And in my culture, uh, mutilation or genital mutilation is not something that is practiced. And there is another reason. Now you see more often people from different backgrounds on the theater. You see black people, black actors, you see uh, South Asian actors, you see Muslims, you see Jews. But 10 years ago that wasn't the case, even in London. So why I should create a play for white people talking about an issue that predominantly happens to colored people. So to, to, yeah. to use this uh, racist concept. So they said, okay, let's, let's go directly to the, to the source of, uh, to the survivors. Let's go to, to this and then put their words on a play on stage with an actor that resembles them. Mm -hmm. So it's trying to keep the chain of truth, truthfulness, if you can say that. Uh, so that was a, it was a, a, it was a decision. It was a, no, not, not something that happens. Like, no, I want it this way. And I had a, a word uh, choosing the actors and who was going to play the main actor, uh, the main character. So yeah, it was, it was conscious, it was very conscious. Hmm. Hmm. So th how about the second one, the, the bread and the salt? So hmm. you decided to, well, because there's a trial, Hmm. Um, is it because there's a trial? Because you know, documentary theatre always, um, I think, the, um, 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 the, uh, uh, it's very popular for documentary theatre to use it. When there's a trial, then they hmm. would, uh, that's the, it, prov it provides the main skeleton for the, for the hmm. play, hmm. like the famous play, The Learning Project. Hmm. I think you know that because there's a trial. Mm -hmm. So is that the is it, it the play starts from that and, mm -hmm. and so was it because there's a trial that you mm -hmm. you decided to make a play out of that how well what makes you I think uh, yeah decide to make a play out of that 
I was very much influenced by the tribunal plays in, in London. I read a lot. Oh, uh, mix, uh, the tricycle theater. The tricycle theater. Yeah. So the tri it was it was called it's, yeah tricycle. tricycle I, I, now theater. it's called something else. Uh, they changed the name. So they published a book with all the tribunal plays. Yes. And I was amazed because I couldn't I couldn't think of something like that in Spain. Uh, you see the tradition of playwriting in Spain and England is completely different. England respects a lot the playwriting. Europe, well, the rest of Europe is more focused on directors and, you know, yeah, settings. Especially and, in Germany. Yeah, so the playwright is okay, but not that okay as in the UK. In the yeah. UK, if they're going to change you a word of your play, your agent can, can jump in and say, no, you cannot change the word. Yeah. Here, it's like, oh yeah, okay, whatever, let's cut this, let's cut this. That's why here you can see Shakespeare in one hour. This is like, that's nonsense. No play of Shakespeare uh, last an hour. Okay. So I decided to do something, a trial, a trial uh, here in Spain. I, I, I didn't know at that time that there were any other trial plays, or at least with a big trial like um, this one. This was, a, it was massive in Spain. But the people don't realize that working on a trial play is a lot of work because, you know, the, the tribunals have a very specific language. It's yes. the, the lawyer language, and that is no it's doesn't uh, work. For yeah, it's very difficult to for make it entertaining. Yes, yes. Especially, you know, when you are talking about you know historical matters and genocide and stuff like that, you you can see any any trial any trial any tribunal, uh, genocide of Rwanda, genocide of Sarajevo, whatever. It's, it's it's annoying. I mean, you get the documents and you have piles and piles of documents and you have to start cutting. But you cannot cut that much because otherwise it will happen what I mentioned before that you are just sending a message mm -hmm. that was bad or this is good. So I decided to do something like that. Uh, fortunately, I had the videos of the trial itself. So I just downloaded the videos and then started transcribing everything. It was, uh, I think, it, we had six you hours. You transcribed that yourself? Huh? Yeah, because there wasn't tools for that at that time. Oh, I mean, okay. we're talking about 2014. Well, at, at last, I didn't know them. Now I will put it on a machine and then tick, 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 yeah, tick, yeah, I will yeah. get it, all the subtitles from YouTube. But it wasn't. And the sound was uh, really bad at that time. So I transcribed everything. It was like 100, 200 pages or something like that. There was a lot of testimonies. There was uh, a lot of, uh, you know, legal, uh, legal word. So I just start, started cutting. And what I wanted to, to do is just to try to express, express the facts. What was talked about in that? It wasn't about the judge, and it wasn't about the testimonies of the victim. It was about how Spain hasn't come to terms with his own history, doesn't understand his own history, and doesn't want to understand his own history, and saying, yes, we had genocide here. Yes, the policy, um, police, military, uh, aristocracy was involved in that, and nobody went to prison. Nobody got judged, and actually they got benefit from it. And that's, mm -hmm. that's a fact. I mean, if you go to any historian uh, from the UK, US, France, all of them will tell you that. And that's, that's proved. And still, we, didn't, we don't have here things like uh, you cannot access archives or files. I mean, it's forbidden. You're an you're a investigator, researcher. Even nowadays? Yeah. Now it's changing. But still, uh, there's, a, um, there's a researcher in the play that says, I cannot access the police, uh, the army archives. Why? Because they don't want to get me in, let me in. So I wanted to make a play about that. Like, um, yeah, we are in a European country, we are you know, in the cool part of Europe, etc., etc. Still, we are hiding our skeletons in the mm. wardrobe or under the bed. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, nothing happened here, nothing happened. So, in that case, I wasn't the producer, I was just the playwright. So I sent the play to Teatro del Barrio, and then uh, a producer picked it up, and then he did all the, the dirty job of putting it together, uh, meaning uh, selecting the actors, selecting the venues, and you know, giving me the money, so this kind of thing. So that was easier for me in the aspect of producing, but it was way harder to write because you had to have the testimonies of people that lost their parents, their grandparents, and they don't even know where they are buried. 
and they are asking administration, please, can you tell me where's the grave of my granddad? And they would say no. Mm. Yeah, you have to forget about that. So that was a little bit the origin of the thing. Mm. You mean that you can't, uh, 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 if, you go, you, if you go to the government office, you say you are a playwright, you are working on a play about that, and you want to get as, as access to the archives, and you won't get it? No. No. No, not even universities. I mean, you can be a researcher, official researcher, or a journalist. Like, I mean, playwrights are, in the, in the scale we are here, yeah? Here are researchers, or maybe, you know, ministers, things like that. If you go to, at that time, if you went to your, the army archives and says, I want to see this and this and this, like, no. Do you have permission? It's like, where do I get the permission? I don't know. You have to find a permission. It's like, yeah, but I want to go there. I mean, it's my right to information. No, you can't. So the play I'm, I've seen, oh, I also have that play. Yeah. Uh -huh, so okay. I, I, that, uh, this play, the, all the contents are from the transcripts you've done. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. So that's Everything. from the video of the, of the, of the court of, of during that play? Yes, of the trial. Yeah. Yeah. Is, but the video, is, is it, it, <laughs> is it pub, uh, it, 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 you open. mean the, peep, the video has been shown on TV? Yeah, local oh. TV. Local oh. TV. Okay. Yeah, so I had to find my way to find the bloody videos. <laughs> oh. I had to call uh, several people, say, where are the videos? And it was, it was a, a private recording. So someone recorded it, and then a local television in a random place, I can't remember now, sorry about that, uh, just posted it on the YouTube. And yeah, it got on the news. The news itself appeared on, you know, big chains and, you know, Televisión Española, like the national TV, but not the entire trial. We were talking about, for instance, the trial that happened here in, in Catalonia about the re illegal referendum. That was televised. That was all over the place. You can get all the records. You can get everything you want. You can get all the declarations, what it was said, what they answer. Like maybe you got two, three months worth of recordings, but for that, they didn't have any. I wrote to the, uh, the association, says, can you give me more? So like, oh, no, this is what, I, what we have. We have nothing else. I called uh, the lawyer from, uh, for the uh, uh, judge, the Garzon. I said, no, no, there's nothing else. That's what you get. I can tell you stories about that, but that's not a legal document, so to speak. I mean, it's something that I can, I, I have to trust you that, that that's okay. true. Yeah. So, uh, so that, Period, the Franco period is still very much a taboo here. Uh, well, it's not taboo because I mean people talk about that. The thing is, much talking, not much doing. Yeah. Okay. So there was uh, now with the new government, there's uh, new laws that are you know that let you at least unbury the corpses of your grandfather mm. uh, before you couldn't do that. You can call the, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the forces. It says, "I know that my grandfather is here. Please unbury it from here, and then put it in a in a Christian grave, for instance." You can do that in certain parts of Spain, but there are still places like El Valle de los Caídos, which is a massive fascist monument that is in Madrid, where there is a lot of people there uh, buried, and the family and the relatives cannot get the bones. Yeah, yeah. They extracted Franco and then buried somewhere else, and then Primo de Rivera, which is another fascist. But there is still a lot to do. And the problem in Spain is that you don't have a central government. I mean, you have a central government, but then you have autonomic uh, yeah. no. governments, yeah. and these sometimes clash. And if you are right, and then the central is left, then okay. I might put some hurdles so you cannot get that. Or I can tell you, we have no money to engrave your father or your okay. grandfather, well, your father, not your grandfather. So there is no enforcement of, this law, of the law. There is a framework, but not, not the thing. So there is still a lot of taboo because a lot of families in power now have connections to the Franco area. They got the money from the Franco area. So I'm talking about bankers. I'm, going to, I'm talking about energy companies. There's a lot of people like that mm. in Spain, and mm. they are in control, so they don't want to 
you know, to move take out much. Yeah, yeah. yeah, to take out the history. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So, mm. Mm. yeah, it's a. Uh, so, how is the the. Uh, I'm, 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 uh, there are quite a lot of questions so, for me. So, um, you said there are hundreds, um, the video of the, you, you, there are hundreds of pages of the transcripts. Yep. So, how, how, how did you do the selection? Mm -hmm. um, on Based on what principles will you select the, well, I see now it's a two to three hours mm. um, the performance length. So, how did you do the selection? Okay, the videos contain a lot of, uh, of legal wording, so that obviously was out of the questions. Uh, I was following more uh, the principles of dramaturgy. It's like action, uh, there has to be action. And it was very important, especially in a, in a play where everyone is seated. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> because they are, they are talking, so the action has to be found on what they say and what they answer. So if you're in a trial, trials are quite boring here in Spain. This is not like in the films from America where, you know, people get very mm. excited and talk and uh, they just say blah, 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 pretty much. So I had to uh, segment it and try to choose topics. And then this was the hardest part because obviously you have a part that is basically defending the Francoist sort of legacy. And it's important to say, well, they also have their reasons to say, I want you to go to jail because we had here a law and you cannot pass that law. You cannot just jump that law. You cannot investigate those crimes because we have a law that forbids you investigating it. And they were claiming crimes that were committed by the other side during the Civil War. Because that is true. I mean, both sides in the Civil War committed crimes. The problem is that one of the sides stayed for 40 years and still committed crimes. The other one was basically smashed. Um, so I wanted to make it uh, as, you know, even as possible, mm. but not, not lying. Because sometimes you can be very cynical about this. Like, okay, both sides did the same thing. So everyone is innocent or everyone is guilty. No, no, no. I mean, here is... I mean, there's 40 years of history, the Francoist history. So basically, I try to cut it into segments. So we are going to talk about, you know, uh, babies that were snatched, then people that were buried, then people that couldn't access the historical archives. And always trying to put some, some structure to it, like uh, the defender and then uh, the offender, so to speak. You know? uh, the judge and, uh, you know, far from our organization that is uh, far right. And then given the audience, the elements, so they can make a judgment, but a fair judgment without manipulating them. So it was like little scenes treating different, uh, different areas of the, of mm. the trial itself. Mm. Mm. So you find the main action yep. and then you try to cut it into different segments, how to how to drive along that main action. Mm -hmm. okay. The question about the play, the bread and the salt is, did I get it wrong? Um, uh, the prosecutor says, that, well, this judge, judge I guess on, you have, um, you have, you, you, you have sentenced that uh, this, 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 this kind of things should not be, uh, uh, should not be tried in the court. Mm. Uh, because it's violated the law mm. in the old days, but now you suddenly you accept it again. Mm. So you are. So w w why is it okay. the case? Well, he never trialed anyone. So Garzón, what he did was open. I think the word is opening proceedings. So it's like I start an investigation, a legal investigation. It's not like the police or I don't know a detective. It's like when you start. The proceedings is a legally binding process so all your research as a judge will go then to a court and that's legal documents and that is something that then the other court to this is done so you can guarantee due diligence if I'm a judge and I'm a corrupt then I can say well you are guilty it's like oh but hold on a second yeah because I know I don't like you so 
in the Spanish in the Spanish law system, you open proceedings, you do a research, but this is legal, and you have to do it according to law. So he started these proceedings, this investigation, in order to obtain information about Franco, about uh, crimes uh, against humanity, and that was an illegal process, because there was a law, and he knew there was a law against that, and that that's the truth. That's why. He went to trial himself. He did those proceedings. Someone stopped saying, you cannot do this. So that trial was stopping there because oh. legally it was illegal, so to speak. Hmm. And then he was judged for opening that because he knew as a judge that the war, that was illegal. That was against that amnesty law. So it's not that he trialed anyone. I mean, he couldn't try Franco. He said, where is Franco? Franco is dead. Yeah. And he opened in proceedings, oh, let's... let's Let's see where is Franco. It's like, well, Franco said it's publicly known. So he did that. Well, I don't know how, why he did that. But it, it was a, a very symbolic thing. I mean, he put his career uh, to an end, pretty much, for doing that. To call the attention, like, this is happening. I cannot judge for genocide. And the funny thing here is that he wasn't, being, he wasn't doing something illegal, internationally speaking. It was illegal in Spain, but international, in any country, you can call uh, for a judge or for a trial if you know that there is a genocide somewhere. You can, for instance, um, that happened with Pinochet. Pinochet was in, in, in London, and Judge Garzón from Spain said, this guy is guilty of genocide. I want to trial him here in Spain. And that is legal uh, regarding the, the international law. And that was changed. That was changed soon after, because because China, China said, obviously in China there are crimes against humanity, there's tortures, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and China is very powerful here in Spain. Well, actually, all over the world. And they say uh, Spain doesn't abide to that, because there were a couple of cases where China was going to be involved in a trial like that, and they say not anymore. Spain doesn't oblige to uh, these international things. So that was the thing. I mean, nothing is perfect, but what he did was was okay according to international law. Soon after that changed. So I mean, if, if you are in any country and you see that or you know that there is genocide in another country, you don't have to judge it there. You can judge it somewhere else, and you can capture the people, bring it there, and that's what happens with, for instance, Rwanda, Yugoslavia, any country like that. And after the Second World War. And after the Second after, World War, for yes. The, for yes. the Nazis. Yeah. yeah. But there, there was more stuff uh, beforehand. Yeah? Uh, so the, the concept of genocide is before the Second World War. Yeah. 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 There are at least uh, things that indicate. I think there was some part of the trial that was uh, saying that. I don't know if I include it now, because uh, it was a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, how is the audience reaction uh, at that time of your play? Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, I mean, the theaters were full of people, <laughs> that's for sure. And it got a lot of uh, attention on the news. And so because you say it's, it's still a little bit sensitive, I think the yeah. issue is... Pro uh, problem with that, I mean, let me be honest, uh, it's like only part of the population is interested in that. And normally it tends to be the people fr from the left. Hmm. The problem is that in Spain we don't have a framework for everyone. So we don't share a common vision of our history. So people from the right say, or oh, people more conservative, I mean, I'm, I'm explaining in broad terms. They say, I don't want to hear about this. Like, oh, it's the same story. It's the, the granddad stories. I don't want to hear that. I'm, I'm past that. And then there are people that are very, you know, like activists and say, oh, yes, let's talk all day about this because this is important. We, we don't come to terms on that. So it's like Spain is divided in two. It's like people that want to forget people that don't want to forget. And I think a middle point will be nice. Mm. With justice, reparation, and you know, documenting that, and then that's it. Mm. We are all Spanish, we are all okay, or Spanish, Catalan, whatever. Uh, so yeah, obviously, you, you don't get, unfortunately, you don't, you don't get theater viewers, you get fans. People that go to the play expecting what they get. And they get it, it's like, oh yes, I got it. This is what I, yeah, true. 
So obviously the the uh, the reviews were okay, and uh, people, you know, went massively there. Which is it's a shame because I'm more interested in someone that doesn't want to hear about that listening to this and says, okay, this is it. No, I mean I, I have it's like Brexit, yeah. Like uh, people that were from you know pro-European were never going to listen to uh, Brexit arguments and the other way around. So yeah, we were kind of polarizing this, this thing. So yeah, I think, I mean, it was fantastic. We got really nice actors on that play and they were very generous because most of them, all of them uh, didn't charge uh, a penny for that. So they did it for free. And it was in big theaters, thanks to uh, the, the directors of those theaters. I mean, they considered that it was important to do that. But sadly, I think, most viewers were convinced uh, before entering the play. So no matter what you put in there, like, oh yeah, I'm going to like it. And I'm telling you this, and I'm the playwright, mm. but I know how it works. Well, I think I know how, how it works. Yeah. yeah, so how you answer the question that sometimes when I do documentary theater in Hong Kong, sometimes people will say that, well, you are, uh, yeah, it's good you waste this point about you waste uh, that uh, something about this issue. But uh, well, you are you are preaching to the converted. All right. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> so because well, the people that, that you come to see your play uh, already yeah. had the same opinion op opinion as you. Yeah. So so how you answer that question? I'll buy you a ticket. <laughs> I'll buy you a ticket. Come and, and I, I've used this. I says I'll buy you a ticket. Go in there, see it. Because what other things can I do? I can keep silent, mm. and that is worse. Because mm. then those things won't be told. Go there, watch it. Come back to me and say you're wrong, and then we start a discussion. And then we start talking, and then we have two people from different poles sitting on a chair or on chairs on table discussing something that is important for both of them and then we can agree on some stuff history or whatever it is the problem is that if you decide not to go or i decide not to write the play the issue remains so at least i think it's important to document it to put it and then invite people go and see it i'll go and see yours and then we will discuss well, i'll buy you a ticket that's what i say and if they say i don't want to go it's like okay then you are trying to see blind, to be blind to the play. So you, you don't want to hear because it hurts, or maybe because you have a history to tell, you have a story to tell. And I, I came across people like that, like say, it's, my family was purged by the communists, and it was really bad. And maybe they were in fascist themselves. So, okay, let's see about your play. Let, let, let's see about your, your experiences. Your let's write a play about that. But the problem is that sometimes it's too painful. Mm. That's difficult. And I wanted to put something of that in the play because they, obviously the prosecutor uses, oh, there was a killing in Paracuellos and there was this and there was that and this and that. So I try to make it, you know, fair. Not equal, but fair. So mm -hmm. everyone can be heard in the trial. And I think uh, that that happened. Yeah. Sometimes I've got another challenge, like, you see, because I, when I explain to people that documentary film is like documentary film, but we use, but it is performed live on the stage, then some people will challenge that, then why don't you do documentary film? It's more real than your theatre work. Uh, and uh, so for cool. example, like you said, there's already been a <laughs> film, uh, a TV about that documentary. So yeah. people may ask, so why not just show the TV again? Yeah. Well, if I'm, you can, yeah. then why do a Hey, about this. Well, I mean, the first thing I will say is that I'm not a filmmaker, so okay. I don't have money for that. But then there is a difference between living the experience than watching on Netflix. Mm. You have to go to a place, you have to remain silent, and then you have to see people sweating the words and saying what you wrote. The experience is completely different. Probably what happens is that the distribution is less. I mean, a film, you can put it on, you know, on Google Play or whatever, and then, yeah, everyone can see it. But the experience is not the same. If you go to a play, the play has more impact because what you see is a human, uh, a real human there, trying his best or her best to do it as truthful as possible. 
is acting as well. But a camera you can cut, say, okay, repeat, cut, yeah. repeat. Yeah. Now I, I use the editing for doing that, that, color. If you make a mistake on theater, the mistake is going to be seen. So I've been more impacted by plays I've seen, that, by films. And I've seen more films that play because obviously it's, it's easier to offer. So the first, I mean, the first answer I would say was, is my choice to do it in theater. And the second will be this. And the third is I have no money for it. You know? <laughs> yes, okay. yes. So uh, the, how's the general situation of the, the Spanish theater? Because, uh, well, we, we hmm. just don't know in Hong Kong. Hmm. So this kind of play, documentary theater or verbatim theater, or theater of social concerns, mm. is it kind of like the minority here? No, or? I think it's actually the opposite. Oh, so mm. a lot of people like yeah. to do this kind of thing. I think it's, it's the, the Spanish theater, Spanish theater, as opposite to, for instance, Catalan theater, which is a little bit separated. Um, yeah, you can find a lot of verbatim theater and a lot of documentary theater. There are places specialized on that. What I, may, I miss sometimes, is a theater that is not built on issues. So now, for instance, we have here um, a law uh, helping uh, trans people to get the ID card uh, easily, right? So they don't have to go through a process of medicalization, etc., etc. And it was a huge debate, no? Because now you can show up in an administration and say, I'm a woman uh, from now on. And then, okay, you're a woman, fantastic. Well, I think it's fair. The problem is that you need to write a play for every single issue that happens in the news. But it seems that the agenda is set up by the news. Uh, and I sometimes miss a broader concept of theatre. Like, okay, let's try not to do a play about every single issue, but something like big issues. I, I, I miss the, the grandiose theatre. Like plays like Arthur Miller, mm. Samuel Beckett, I don't know, uh, Tennessee Williams, plays that you know, try to get a, a huge concept of theater. So now I, I've seen plays about pretty much every everything, like vaginismus. You know, I've seen a play about this, which is I think is a very important issue. Uh, but you know, it's quite locked up in the moment, and then ten years later, it's like okay, yes, it, this play doesn't mean anything. Yeah. So that I think that the current status is that. Having said that, I mean, that sounds quite pessimistic. I think the production is going well. I mean, there's a lot of women entering uh, the, the arena of playwriting, which is good because Spanish theatre was very male-oriented and it was non-social. So I think we are going to the other, other extreme. I mean, before theatre was for entertainment and then now it's for, uh, you know, it's, it's more political. Well, can we find, you know, <laughs> a way in between? Uh, so I think it's, 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 it's quite an exciting moment, but it's quite precarious. Uh, you don't make money uh, doing theatre in Spain, especially as a playwright. You need to be a man for all. So, mm. for instance, I, I mean, I write plays, but I have other jobs. I had to do... Uh, you also write for TV and film? Do you? Uh, no, that's also precarious. I do training, like, for instance, I teach other people how to write. Mm. All right, so creative writing, stuff like that. Because in, in Spain, I don't know how it will be uh, in Hong Kong, uh, it's quite subsidized. Uh, but you don't get a lot of money for writing plays. You get money for production, for moving around your play, but I mean, making a life, a life out of writing is complicated in Spain. It's just the same in Hong Kong. Yeah, is it? Because I have my playwright and yeah. not really get anything <laughs> <laughs> writing. Yeah, and I, I have other jobs as well, so I always say, Playwriting is not my job. <laughs> it's just my yeah. passion. My well, I, <laughs> I, I'm, I think I spend more than I earn. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I tend to say it's my profession. Then I have my job. Yeah. But my profession or how I define myself is I'm a writer. Not even a playwright, a writer because I write all kind of stuff. Uh, because otherwise you fall into the trap and say, oh, this is like a hobby. I go and from time to time I'm successful and that's it. So, yeah, I mean, I think the... the, the the atmosphere in Spain is, is, is good. Uh, there's a lot of communication between playwrights and stuff like that. But at, at, I think it's still uh, the, the, the industry is, is childish, not the mm. playwrights. Uh, I mean, if you want to do an independent play and then you have a musical, it's like, okay, let's forget about the independent play, let's do the musical. 
Yeah, it's, it's where private investment is going. When I was in London, I think there was more interest in all kind of theater. And you went everywhere, even a bar had a theater on top of the bar, and then you yeah, saw yeah. plays that were perfectly professional. Yes. Here, amateurish or no well-funded plays tend to be uh, mm. not too good, not too mm. good, even if the text is okay. And mm. the other thing is that you don't have that much training, especially for playwrights. You got a couple of schools, but I don't think I don't think they produce nice playwrights. I think playwrights tend to find themselves trained going out somewhere else. Mm. This is most successful playwrights in Spain have went to the Royal Court in London to study okay. there, or they got a master's uh, in New York. Mm. Uh, here you got Sala Beckett, but it's kind of half professional. I mean, the training is half professional, half non-professional. So it's kind of kind of weird situation here compared to other countries. So you don't have the Spain don't have a kind of like the National Academy that kind of, oh, yes. of drama. You do, you do. You have you do. The, yeah, yeah, of definitely. Yeah. But it, it's not national; it's uh, autonomic. So oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. you got one which is called uh, Resat, which is based on Madrid mostly, and then Andalusia. But for instance, here you got uh, a Catalan Academy. Then in Galicia mm. you have the Galician. Mm. In Andalusia you have the Andalusia, and this is not common framework. Uh, but this is politics. I mean, I'm not too much into how is organized the, uh, the education in Spain, so I might be wrong. But that the feeling I have is that every single town, every single community is doing their own theater. And, mm. you know, Catalan plays are not seen that much in Galicia or Basque Country is not going to see the Madrid. So it's quite, you know, segmented. Okay. Mm -hmm. yes. So it's also because of that reason you went to um, UK to study for your degree, for your master. I think that was one of the reasons. Uh, I wanted to study theatre in Spain, but I had to work. And the, the timetables were incompatible. I couldn't study theatre or playwriting. I was interested in playwriting, uh, but I had to work. And then I needed something that was professional. It wasn't just a course on the evenings that gave me a degree, that gave me a degree. And in Spain, there, there was no way, or it was way too expensive. So I moved to London, I found, found a job there. And then I went to City University that offered a master's degree, official master's degree, in the evenings. So I just went there and then studied for two years, created a play and put a play and produced a play. Mm -hmm. And obviously, I mean, I don't know how it's in Spain because I, I didn't study like a full course on Spain. But I thought, uh, I thought that Anglo-Saxons tend to have it right. So like, let's go straight to the point. Let's write stuff. Let's read this, 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 and then uh, let's leave the theory for other times. So it was very well focused, I think, and I, I enjoyed it a lot actually, and I learned a lot on that masters. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So now you are. Do you think you you you, you just say before recording you say that you are working on a play and it's a it's not a forbidden play because you have your family now working on a forbidden play it takes up a lot of the time. So mm. do you think in future you continue to work on, uh, uh, um, mm -hmm. you have another forbidden play? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I have other plays written. Uh, the problem is that finding a producer is difficult. Or maybe because the play is too big. But mm -hmm. I, I had a play about the referendum here in Catalonia. And I sent it to the National Theatre in Catalonia and a couple of people. But unfortunately, it's, it's a big play, it's massive. So you need a lot of money and it's a touchy subject here mm -hmm. yet. I mean, it's quite close in time. And it was about the debate uh, on the parliament, the Catalan parliament, about whether to go f you know, forward or stop it. Uh, I, uh, that was really hard work because there's a lot of, imagine six hours of debate and six hours the next day to go like, I don't know, 500 pages of transcriptions. And I got the transcriptions, fortunately, in this case. And you got a lot of actors, a lot of politicians talking about uh, the same. And I, I liked it a lot, I mean, writing it, but unfortunately, it's, I think it's quite big. And then, um, that's, that's pretty much what I, what I worked more recently. But the, yeah, I, I think it's a nice technique of a bait team. Uh, and you always use it on your, I mean, in your fictional plays. You always do the research, you ask people, you talk to this, you talk to that. 
and sometimes you include those those dialogues, but uh, you know, it's, it's something that once you get in, it's, it's difficult to get out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what step play about what what, what step play you just mentioned written in? Um, I think it's written in Catalan, uh, mm -hmm. in Spanish, but uh, yeah. is there an English version? I really want to see oh. it, if you <laughs> right. call that an English version. No, why? I don't think so. But, okay, okay. I mean, Later. nowadays you can translate easily with a Google Translator. <laughs> oh, yeah, the Google Translator. Yeah. I mean, it actually works quite well. <laughs> ah. I've read things in Turkish. And it's well, okay, fair enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah it's yeah, quite intelligent you know. nowadays. <laughs> yeah, so if you yeah. want, I can send it to you if you want. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. I would really love to take yeah. it. But not sure. Mm -hmm. Maybe not. Well, because that 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 argument about independence is really, you know, is also very yeah. very relevant to the yeah. situation in Hong Kong. Surely, true. And when I read this, I'm I'm really mm. attracted. In fact, is the bread and the salt, I think. Mm -hmm. the, the, mm, the, the try to forget the history, I think is, uh, oh, mm. it is it's universal, I think. Whenever there's a, mm. it's always painful for people to, mm. to face the history sometimes. So I, I don't think it's, a, it's something for people. I think it's more for the winning party. So yes. if you have a war and you win, you want to erase your crimes. To say, well, we were right. Mm. Yeah, and that, that's what happens. That's what, for instance, if you look at Argentina now, you've got a candidate that probably is going to win the elections. And they say, he says, there was no dictatorship. It was a war. So he's changing, he's manipulating the language yeah, yeah. to yeah. erase the memory. And Argentinians are one of the people in, in the entire world that work very hard to establish what happened during the dictatorship. And they have very strong NGOs and associations working for that. And they are, I mean, if you were a military on those times, they are paying the ass for you. I mean, they won't let you, they won't let it go. And why is that? Because if you come to terms with your history and you say, this happened, you can go forward. So. Yes. And now this guy is trying, okay, what you did for the last 30, 40, 50 years is worthless. You don't get it. It was a war. And then people say, oh, it was a war. No, it was a war and it was a war. And 20 years later, when you repeated this mantra several times, people say, no, 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 that wasn't a war. Talk to the, uh, to the Turkish and the Armenian genocide. They would say, no, 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 that, wasn't, that never existed. There was proof. There is proof. It happens all the time. But it's not the people. People want to have uh, memory. They want to remember, to forget, or to forgive as well. Uh, but if you deny mm -hmm. that possibility of memory and mourning, it will come back to you. And that's why in Spain we still, 40 years later, we're still talking about Franco. Like, I mean, we shouldn't be talking about fascist this dictator that died 40 years ago. We shouldn't be moving forward to Europe, to the world, whatever. We still spending a lot of uh, a lot of energy on this this is pointless like why why are we talking about this mm. yeah well, because in the old days you can't talk about it yeah directly <laughs> in what in, in, in hong kong you mean? Uh, you, you mean i mean uh, here you know the, well in hong kong uh. definitely not <laughs> a lot of things are <laughs> yeah uh, they are taboo now yeah. a lot of things that we can't talk about now mm. yes. i mean but in the old days you can because i've direct I think I, uh, I bet you know a Spanish playwright, uh, Antonio uh, Vallejo. Mm -hmm. Antonio uh, Vallejo. Yeah. yeah, I think he's very famous. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah he's the, yeah. I've directed, he, I've translated and direct two of his work. All uh, right. The Burning Darkness and, okay. and The Foundation. Oh, yes. Yes, and then uh, I found that, well, well, yeah. because he's directly talking, well, he's indirectly talking about oh yes, the but Spanish he was government. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah everything is uh, uh, you, uh, yeah. You just couldn't talk about oh yeah that directly at that time and in his time. I think it's funny that you mentioned Boro Vallejo because he was, I think, he was a very brave playwright because he was writing under the dictatorship about the dictatorship and the lifestyle in the dictatorship. 
when Franco died, everybody, everybody forgot about him. It's like you cannot see Buero Vallejo's place anymore on, on theaters. And this is something that happened in Spain after Franco died. Every playwright that was associated somehow to the, uh, to the Franco or playwrights that were just successful during Franco, they don't put it anymore. And you got really nice playwrights that worked during uh, Franco times and they are not political or anything like they're just funny or they're just entertaining. And you don't see them anymore. There is like some kind of revenge against those writers. If you got it right during Franco, then you are not good. And this has happened a lot, not only in playwriting. Boro Vallejo wasn't particularly from, uh, from Franco's side, obviously. But since he was kind of successful during that time, he's not represented anymore. You don't see it that often. And there was, I think, the, the centenary, like he would have made 100 years. You don't see plays, Boro Vallejo. And if you go, if you go to the UK, you see Shakespeare all over the place. You yeah, see yeah. Uh, <laughs> Howard Pinter, Howard Pinter everywhere, yeah, yeah. Beckett. I mean, they constantly do that. But why someone, he could have been a, a Nobel Prize in Spain. Uh, why your most important playwright is not constantly on, you know, on theaters in Spain. Yeah. It's like, and there is a political, uh, political thing about that. Oh. Yeah, it, it happens. I mean, it, it runs deep. All, all that uh, resentment against the winners or against the losers, or that. I mean, oh. it, it's not an easy task <laughs> oh, so to be a play with in Spain. Wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it really uh, amazes yeah. me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it happens. Oh, yeah, because I found that he uh, is. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's, he's, he's amazing. He, he, should he's be, he should be like the the most of uh, mm. the master playwrights, I think, in oh, yeah. Spain. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, he's not, yeah, as I say, it, it's mm. UK, if it's in UK, I think his play mm. will be performed very often. Um, at least yeah. one or two his, of his plays will be, yeah. will be constantly seen, uh, I think, on the stage. Wow. I think what, what happens in, in the UK and other countries, uh, forgive me if I get this wrong, is that you don't get the money from the government to put a play. You get the money from uh, the lottery, uh, lottery Foundation, I think the National Lottery Foundation, which is an independent uh, organism. You, say you get money from the lottery and then the lottery funds cultural events or funds a lot. At least when we did uh, Little Stitches, we get the money from the lottery fund. That is very good because uh, you are getting the money based on uh, the play itself. If it's good, bad, if it, uh, if it makes the, I don't know, the society better, if you treat racism, in this case it was uh, FGM. So you don't depend on politicians to put a play. In Spain, you have to request the money to the government or to the uh, major town. So it's basically politicians deciding on that. And if a politician says, I don't want to fund any play about the civil war, you don't get any money. Mm. Or you get less money. And all the people will get more money. And that is a real problem. I mean, we need an independent uh, uh, NGO organism or whatever or company funding plays and they have to decide they have to have a clear guidance on what they want or what they will fund if you're going to do an anti-semitic uh, play that you don't get any money you have to find private investors for that and then you cannot put it in a public uh, thing but here i think you can get money for that i mean if you make the wording okay you can get an anti-semitic play Honestly, I uh, well maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit. Well, uh, there are certain places like, how do you get money for this? And then you see that there is some. Is there an arts council like the UK in Spain? There is a arts council, and they are well, it would be the Ministry of Culture, so to speak. Okay. But it changes so often. I mean, every four years they uh, put tourism there, then they bring out the tourism. They they put sports there, so basically like. 
you know. So and, and it's all controlled by, as you said, by politicians. Yeah, normally. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You don't get too many private events. Well, if you do a comedy show or something like that, yeah, oh, you musical, get private. Yeah, musical yeah. things like that. But if you want to put Howard Pinter here in Spain, nah, you. I mean, so unless you have big actors there, and you don't even have guaranteed the money back. So serious drama will not. Yeah. Uh, well, it's, it's difficult to survive. Oh yeah, for yeah. serious drama. Yeah, yeah. The problem is that, I mean, musicals you can have two or three in a time in a city like Barcelona. So you, only okay. three writers of musicals will be surviving. Okay. Uh, serious drama, you get more serious drama in, in Barcelona, but in small venues, so you don't get your money back. Okay. So it's quite it's quite precarious. I mean, you, you don't make a lot of money. It's more, but I mean, there's a lot of energy. That's that is true. Thanks a lot, in fact, wow. Okay, and, uh, thank you very much.